Hello, this is Terry Norrington from Transform Worldwide Ministries. And this week we have been looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And as usual, we will look at the verses and the commentaries. So we will start off, first of all, with verses 1 to 3. Now about food sacrifice to idols. We know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do know, do not yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. For God, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is probably the most quoted verse from the Bible, and it has been used many a times in these teachings. I heard the question asked the other day, how much faith does one have to have to, have to be saved? If we believe in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us in order for our sins to be forgiven, then we are saved. In other words, John 3.16 from there on, it doesn't matter how deep into our faith we have ventured. It doesn't matter how long we have been walking the path with Jesus. As long as we believe in our hearts, then we are saved. There are many testimonies of deathbed conversions, people who have found Christ shortly before they have passed away. They would not have had any time in which to build up any knowledge of Jesus. They would not have known the words of John 3.16 but they had found a friend in Jesus. They believed in him and that was and that was their saving grace. Whilst we would encourage all believers to study scripture and hear the words that God has for them, not all Christians will devote time to study. They don't build up their knowledge of God. And this is okay because their belief has saved them. Sometimes there can be a tendency of those Christians who do build up their scriptural knowledge to look down on those that don't. This can be an arrogant attitude, puffing themselves up with their, with their knowledge. No doubt it helps to have a more in-depth knowledge of God, but that isn't what God is requiring of us. He doesn't want us to know about him. He wants us to know him, have a personal relationship with him. Paul says that knowledge puffs up while love, love builds up. While well, having a lot of knowledge, we can be prideful, thinking higher of ourselves than we should. But do we have love in our hearts? Many of those who seem to be weaker Christians have less head knowledge of God. Have, uh, and have le having less knowledge of God, they have a greater heart knowledge of God. They know how to love. And as the image of God is love, they are shining his love and glory. Four to six. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ. Through him all things came, and through him we live. Isaiah 43 says this, You are my witness, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor will there be, be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from that me there is no Saviour. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed, I and not some foreign God among you. You are my witness, declares the Lord, that I am God. And in James 2 we read this, But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith but by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good, even the demons believe that, and shudder. 
So here we see two Bible passages, one from the Old Testament and from one from the New, showing that there is only one true God. There are many more passages in the Bible confirming that there is only one God and he is the one we worship. We praise him and we have faith in him. In the passage from James chapter 2, we see that even the enemy recognises the one true God and shudders in his pre presence. Unfortunately, much of today's world fails to recognise what we know to be true. Indeed, they will have many other idols. Other religions will have multiple gods, while other people will worship their careers, sports teams and celebrities. But all these paled, pale into insignificance. They are made man-made, whilst man is God-made. Recently, I had someone criticising these teachings, proclaiming that the teachings gave no evidence for a one true God. But how much evidence does anyone need when we look at creation? From the vastness of the expanding universe to the tiniest of atoms, it is far beyond the understanding of man. There has to be a creator who designed it all and placed it into being, the one true God. And when man wants evidence to satisfy man's intelligence, is it is it not believing that man's intelligence is the ultimate intelligence? Is it not arrogant to think that man should have the answer to everything? Jesus himself understood how man wants to see evidence before believing. In John 4, we read, Unless you, you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. Faith is about believing in what, we cannot, what cannot be seen. As Christians, we believe first and then we see. We see the wonderful love of our creator God. There are some religions that believe in one God, but they view that God in a completely different way to us Christians. They will see a vengeful God who requires death and violence to satisfy him. But the God that we as Christians believe in is a God of love and peace. This is the one true God and we can find him through his son, Jesus Christ. Verses 7 to 8. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god, and since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat, and no better if we do. In Matthew 15, Jesus tells us, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. This overrides the commands from Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14, which gave the nation of Israel commands on which animals could be eaten and which ones could not. Which animals were clean and which ones were unclean? Similarly, Islam has restrictions on what meat can be eaten and which ones cannot. And there are other religions too that have their sacred animals. But as it is, as if to confirm Jesus' words, the Apostle Peter had a vision whilst in a trance and, can, and, be, and it can be read in Acts 10. And verses 15 tells us, The voice spoke to him a second time, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. There will be born again Christians new to the faith who will bring some of the customs of a previous religion across into their newfound faith. But God tells us that food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat, no better if we do. That said, there will be some cultural issues that means that certain animals will not be eaten. In Western society, eating dogs or horses will make people wince, perhaps even make them feel sick. These are beloved animals that are protected by human rights laws. But in the Far East, there are, they are, these are eaten as a matter of course. But as said, this is cultural, not biblical, and is very much a matter of conscience. But to really reiterate Jesus' teachings, it is what comes out of our mouth that defiles us and defines us, and our words can't come from our hearts. If our hearts are impure, then what comes from our mouths we will be impure too. Let's guard our hearts. 9 to 12. 
Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if somebody with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating an idol in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. So as a Christian, we have so much more freedom than other religions. These other religions bind their followers in chains that God does not require of us. But whilst we rejoice in this freedom, we don't always have to exercise this freedom. Sometimes we have to be aware of circumstances and particularly those around us. New followers in Christ need to be weaned from milk to solid food. They may well be holding on to baggage from a previous religion or have some misunderstanding about the new, the, their newfound faith in Christ. And for the mature uh, Christian to go, uh, go about ex exercising the freedoms that we have in Christ may be confusing to our new follower even burdening their conscience. So we have to be aware of the, the things we say or do when we are around them. They may perceive that we are being sinful, hypocritical, even though we may be doing absolutely nothing wrong in God's eyes. That said, we also need to be practising biblical truths. And as teachers and preachers, it is very important to be holding up these biblical truths. There are many false, te false teachers uh, teachings by celebrity preachers that don't come from scripture that have been man made up in order to impress an audience and increase their following other followers of such preachers weak christians believing in false teachings that have no biblical foundation the prosperity gospel is one such example god promises us much blessings if we turn to him through his son but those blessings aren't necessarily financial god is a provider but he provides for our needs, not our wants. Suggesting that otherwise does not come from the Bible. And Jesus does tell us in Matthew 24, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. We have to be sensitive to other Christians, particularly the new followers of Christ. Let's ensure we build up their faith and do not destroy it. Verse 13. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause them to fall. Paul is very concerned that our words and actions won't cause new Christians to fall by the wayside. Even though we may be completely solid in God's eyes, in our talking and our doing, <clears throat> yet if our new following Christ is doubtful, then he or she may be discouraged uh, discouraged with Christianity and fall back into sin. So we must be sensitive to their thoughts and understandings. Paul goes on to say that if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again. This was a sacrifice that Paul was prepared to make in order to prevent a fellow brother or sister from falling. The sacrifice wasn't a requirement of God, but it would demonstrate his love for others and he was prepared to make it a lifetime commitment. It will be a form, a form of denying oneself out of respect for fellow believers. This begs a question, are we prepared to sacrifice something for the benefit of a fellow Christian? I'm sure we all at some point have given up something for the 40 days of Lent, but this is for building up our own spiritual well-being. Would we prepare to be, to be prepared to sacrifice, sacrifice something for the benefit of others? And will we prepare, be prepared to give it up for a lifetime? What will we be prepared to sacrifice for Jesus? Genesis chapter, two, uh, chapter 22 is devoted to Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his son Isaac, a sacrifice he was prepared to make as God had asked him to, excuse me, to show his love and faithfulness to God. Isaac was the son that he thought he would never have with his wife, Sarah. Isaac was the son that God had promised him and Sarah in, promised him and Sarah in their old age. And, uh, and it was the start of a nation that Abraham would be the father of. And now it seemed that God was now wanting to take this all away from him. 
Yeah, Abraham remained faithful, willing, remained willing and faithful. Of course, God provided a way out through a sacrificial lamb. He'd been testing Abraham all along and he had passed the test with flying colours. How far would we go to show our love for God? How far would we go to show our love for one another? I'm sure God will never ask us to sacrifice the lives of one of our family members. But let us remember, God did. He sacrificed his begotten son for our salvation. That is how much he loves us. So let us pray. Father, we have the courage of our convictions as we dedicate our lives to you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.